Hello everyone! Today we will talk about the last stage of the glass synthesis. It is the glass inspection. But really, the glass inspection really uh, usually occurs due to special regularities and standards. And for each country, regu these regularities and standards are different. That is why this part of the lecture will be in two languages, in English and in Russian, because basically, uh, originally, it is based on the Russian standards that is called GOS. Okay, what about standardized indicators of glass quality? They are refractive index deviation and average dispersion deviation. What means deviation? Uh, these are deviations from the refractive index and mean dispersion that should be in this glass type. And these are the deviation uh, between real uh, refractive index of the glass that we have obtained after the synthesis and uh, uh, refractive index that should be in this type of the glass, based on the documents, for example. Okay, in Russian the same. Here we have categories and classes. Category is for uh, deviation of refractive index and mean dispersion for one glass blank and uh, classes are for a series of glass blanks. Standard measurement methods for refractive index are goniometric with the help of goniometry, refra a refractometric with the help of the refractometer ABBE and uh, interferential uh, which is based on the interference of light in the system where we have immersion fluid and inside of it the glass blank. We have several kinds of immersion fluids and uh, different ranges of refractive index of, of glasses that we can measure with the help of different types of immersion fluid compositions. The next indicator of glass quality is optical uniformity or uniformity of glass in terms of refractive index. The biofringence. Usually, uh, optical uniformity is uh, measured with the help of this experimental setup, where we have collimator telescope, the lamp, and this type of the picture that goes through the glass blank sample. Here we have a bunch of the hatches. Here, the distance between hatches is very big. And here, the distance between hatches is very small. So, if we take a glass blank made of the ideal glass, we will see all the hatches exactly, even with a little distance between them. But if we take the glass blank made of the pure quality glass, then we will see only hatches from the first row. Using the number of the set of hatchers, we can calculate the optical uniformity of the glass measured. Standard measurement method for the biofringence is based on the polaroscope polarimeter, where we have a set of the polarizers 1 and 2, and 2, sorry, the filter and the glass blank. The next indicator is the weakening index, or the index that shows us how the light weakens while trespassing through the glass blank. It is very close to the glass transmittance coefficient. The next very important indicator is the presence or the absence of the stries, which is called strialessness. Uh, I was talking about striers the previous lecture, and I said the striers is the uh, inhomogeneity in glass which uh, has another chemical composition than the original glass should have. So here we have several categories of the strialessness. 
where the first three the first two categories not don't allowed don't allow their strides at all, but last category allow them allows them. In Russia it will call Bisfinist. Here you can see the photo of the lot of strides in the glass volume. And of course we have indicator that tells us the presence of the absence of the bubbles inside of the glass volumes and their biggest diameter during the bubble category and the average number of the bubbles inside of the one kilogram of the glass. Also you can see the photo of the glass with a lot of bubbles here. The method for measuring strawlessness and bubbling is a so-called shadow method. Here we should have a very big glass blank and a lamp. We irradiate by this lamp our glass blank and on the screen beside the glass blank we can examine the shadows that our glass gives. With the help of these shadows we can calculate the presence that we can see the presence of the absence of strides and we can calculate the number of the bubble number of bubbles inside of the glass bank and their mean size and also the biggest bubbles. And the last standardized indicator is their inclusions, absence of presence. Inclusions means other glass defects without counting strides and bubbles. About glass defects we will talk a little bit later. Also, there are several properties that are very important for the classes, and they are also standardized. standardized. First of, all, of them is radiation optical resistance. Usually, when we expose uh, the glass by the hard radiation or the ultraviolet radiation, the transmittance of this glass in the visible region decreases. That's why uh, several types of glasses were synthesized that re that are resistant to the ultraviolet and hard radiation. They are called radiation optical resistant glasses. And here you can see several types of them and uh, the changes of the optical transmittance uh, while calculating uh, while irradiating of these glasses by hard re radiation. In Russia it will be like this one. Also, we classify our glasses due to the gradient hardness. So, the hardness of glasses while we make gradient. In Russia, it will look like относительная твердость по сошлифованию. And also, chemical resistance of the glasses. First, it is resistance to humid atmosphere. It is very important to know uh, while we store our glass for some time. And the resistance of glass to weakly acidic aqueous solutions and water. Here we have we use reagents of a solution of acetic acid and distilled water and look how they affect the surface of the glass. And Russian. So, let's talk about glass defects. Glass defect is a defect visible to our naked eye that impairs the appearance or limits the use of the glass. It would have destructive and non-destructive defects by the type they, they affect on the usage of the glass. And we classify defects by their shape, so that's why we have local, spherical, elongated and linear defects. The first well-known defect is bubble. Bubble is a cavity in the glass of various size and shapes. Shapes. We have closed bubbles that are situated in the glass volume. We have superficial bubbles that are close to the glass surface, and we have open bubbles, uh, which cavity is open to the glass surface. We also have capillary bubbles of such form, and seed bubbles that are in Russian are called mashka. Uh, they are bubbles uh, 
the size of which do not, do, does not exceed one millimeter. Of course, we should talk about stries. Stri is an inclusion in glass that has a vitreous structure, which differs from the main glass in chemical composition or appearance. We also have different kinds of stries, inner stri that are embedded in glass, surface stri on the surface, thread stri, core stri, and knot stri, that is, that is a core stri with thread-like stri extending from it. This is a type of the cores of the knot stri. And also we have the, such a type of stri as cord. In Russia it will be schlir. Surface stri, that, that is a surface stri in the form of the drop of the nailing glass which has retained its shape. For example, this is a card. Another glass defect is stone, that is an inclusion in glass of various size, shapes and colors that has a crystalline structure. It can be either a product of the structure of refractories, this will be refractory stones. Incomplete batch mixture gives us batch stones, and uh, just product of glass crystallization gives us decks, as you can see here and here. As you know, raw materials for glass synthesis are, can, be, can be of natural, uh, of mineral nature and of chemical nature. Uh, if we talk about chemical raw materials, they are divided into technical and reactive. And reactive raw materials are divided by their purity. In Russia, they are divided into чистые, чистые для анализа, химически чистые и особо чистые. In the United States, uh, another grading exists. Here we also have technical grade, purified, laboratory, region grade, and other grades of the raw materials. The colored is one of the part of the raw materials of the glass batch. Consists of crushed, cleaned from contaminants and inclusions glass waste obtained on the previous or another stages of its production. Colored is usually from 30 to 40 percent of the weight of the melt. Its addition reduces the required amount of chemical or mineral raw materials and facilitates the conditions of glass synthesis. But its main advantage is that it contains a, a very big amount of impurities that we can't control. Glass melting vessels uh, have also are divided into several types by their material. Most types of glasses are melted in vessels made of silicate materials. I mean vessels, quartz, crucibles or melting tanks. Usually uh, such materials are based on the fire clay, a product obtained after firing clay or its mixture with kaolin. To protect the bottom and walls of such vessels from destructive effect of molten glass, because you know molten glass is very chemically aggressive, uh, we usually use a thin layer protective coatings that are based on the aluminium oxide. As you remember, aluminium oxide is a very high temperate material. Glasses with high content of acid oxides are usually melted in fused silica vessels. Uh, fused silica has the melting temperature of more than 1700, and that means that uh, we can synthesize a gla uh, glasses inside of such vessels that have the melting temperature lower than 1700 degrees. Uh, glass types that um, include a lot of uh, oxides of thorium, zirconium, and latinium usually are melted, usually melt, are melted in the platinum vessels because such types of oxides really fast uh, destroy really fast the silicate materials and uh, the fused silica vessels. What about? Uh, glass fragility or brittleness. Really, the glass is brittle and that's why one of the main uh, the main problems of glass forming is uh, to make it more hard or more tough. 
That's why we're talking about glass hardening. There are several properties of glass that are very important for glass hardening. First of all is the glass strength. It's a property of materials to resist destruction under the influence of external forces. We have theoretical and practical glass strength. Theoretical is a con uh, glass strength is a conventional value that is estimated for some ideal depact free homogeneous glass loaded by a quasi-static force at low temperatures. Theoretical glass strength depends on the nature and strength of chemical bonds of the glass structure and it is a material characteristic. Usually, we are talking about silicate glass and uh, the energy of the bonds between silicon and oxygen atoms is very big. That's why uh, theoretical glass strength yields theoretical, theoretical value of 17 gigapascals. But what about practical glass strength? Is a characteristic of real glass products that is determined by surface defects uh, such as scratches, bubbles, homogeneous inclusions, and uh, any other mechanical distinguishable phases. And because of this, it is very. It is only from one thousandth to one to one hundred of the theoretical value. If we look on this picture, we can see that effective uh, crack length decreases while the tensile strength of the glass will increase. Something uh, in this region, we, in this region, sorry, we have a theoretical glass strength. Number one line is strength at fast rate forces application, and number two is long term strength. The description of the glass strength can be based on several theories. It's the classical fracture mechanics, where glass is an ideal elastic solid body. Second, it's linear fracture mechanics. Second, uh, third, kinetic fracture theory. And the last one is Griffith's energy fracture theory. The second property of the glass is the glass hardness. It is the ability to resist deformations and destruction of glass surface layer. Glass hardness is usually characterized by intendation, scratching or, or abrasion with the irredental material. Here you can see several setups for, uh, for the glass hardness calculation by intendation. Various experiments techniques have been developed to test the glass hardness. We have several methods, like Vickers method. It is the indentation of the diamond pyramid with an apex angle equal to this one. Knuth's method, the indentation of the diamond-shaped par diamond pyramid. And Brinell's method is the indentation of the steel ball with a diameter of one millimeter. Here we have the Brinell's method and the Vickers method. The value of micro hardness is defined as the ratio to the applied force of the applied force to the area of the obtained impression by the pyramid. Here we can see the photographs of the surface of glass after the intendation of the Vickers pyramid. And the last glass property is the glass brittleness. It's a property to collapse without plastic deformation under the action of stresses arising in glass. According to another definition, the brittleness of the glass is defined as the ratio of the hardness of the material to its fracture toughness. The brittle nature of the glass fracture manifests itself under conditions when the rate of action of external applied force is much higher than the rate of the relaxation of the rising stresses inside of the glass. The, uh, as a characteristic of glass brittleness, the value of impact strength can be used. So, based on the two definitions of the glass brittleness, we can uh, provide two different equations for its calculation. And if we use this calculation and this one, based on different, uh, based on um, different values, but using the same experiment made by the micro hardness according to Vickers, we will see that these two values are very close. They ha have only one five or oh, five percent difference. What about Griffith's model? 
Griffith says that microcracks are local violations of the surface layer of glass and they are caused by the abrasive action of solid particles or chemical interaction with the atmospheric moisture. For example, here we can see microcracks and its depth. Such cracks are the concentrators, concentrators of stress and uh, stresses arise in them in magnitude significantly exceeding the external mechanical stresses applied to the sample. So it means that internal mechanical stress that are applied to the glass is, uh, uh, for every case, is much more smaller than the stresses applied from the microcracks. What is about the glass strength? How we can examine it? In what directions? We can determine, determine the glass strength of, on textile, compression or bending. The bending method is one of the mostly widely used and here we can see the so-called three-point method where we have the glass of bulk and the force that is applied in the middle of this bulk. Uh, while applying the force we will provide the compression stresses in this region and the tension stresses uh, in this region. Based on the stresses and the shape of the glass block, we can obtain the bending strength of the glass. How to increase the glass strength? We, firstly, we should minimize the surface defects and factors contributing to their occurrence and development. Um, Based on this, we can use three different methods. First, uh, we should protect the glass surface from abrasion and prevention of mechanical contact. Second, we should use as dry and chemical inner glass atmosphere as possible while we uh, during storage and operation of glass products. And third, we should use protective polymer coatings. We, we have different uh, glass strengths uh, based on the surface condition of this glass. We ca you can see here that the glass strength n increases while we press in, grinding, polishing and extra polishing the glass. What glass hardening methods can we use? First of all, we can create comprehensive stresses in the surface layer of the glass. Based on this, we can use glass tempering, ion exchange, application of glazes, which cause lamination, and surface sealization. Uh, glass surface hardening methods include removal of defective surface layer by glass etching, fire polishing, or application of inorganic oxide or polymer coating. What about glass tempering? Tempering consists uh, in creating constant internal stresses by cooling the material from temperature exceeding the glass transition temperature at which glass has plastic properties. Tempering means very, very, very fast cooling of the glass melt. I was talking about it previously when I was showing you the changes of the refractive index while cooling the glass melt. <clears throat> uh, how can we uh, make a tempering of the glass? We increase cooling intensity by using forced air convection, mineral oils, silicon organic liquids or melts of salts and metals. The next method of glass hardening is ion exchange. It's the process of exchange of alkaline ions between the glass surface and the melt layers at temperatures below the glass transition interval. Here, for example, we have sodium, alum uh, sodium aluminum silicate glass and we have the molten salt of molten potassium salts. Uh, during ion exchange, we um, have um, sodium ions that are going from the structure of the glass up to the melt and potassium ions going inside of the glass structure. That's why this ions has a, some kind of exchange. That's why it's called, this process is called ion exchange. Chemically toughened glass has the following advantages of the thermal glass. 
It has improved impact resistance, improved flexibility, strength, scratch resistance, and improved resistance to temperature changes. Uh, this um, method of uh, toughening the glass is used uh, in the screen glasses for smartphones, televisions, and so on and so forth. The second method for glass toughening or hardening is lamination. Uh, it is the deposition of the layer of the glaze, that is, fusible glass, on the surface of the toughened glass, which is characterized by a low coefficient of thermal expansion in comparison to the glass. That's why here we will have the compression, the um, compression on the near the surface of the glass and in the surface of the glass and tension in the volume. The advantages of lamination is its simplicity and the absence of specific requirements for the chemical composition of the toughened glass that can it can be used for mass production of glass products. And here you can see the scheme of the technological line for glass lamination on the factory. Its main disadvantage is its incomplete versatility, a significant change in the surface relief of glassware and change in its optical properties. Surface crystallization is the process of crystallization at elevated temperatures crystals that are precipitated uh, of crystals uh, that have lower coefficient of thermal expansion than the original glass. That means that on the surface of the glass we will have a thin crystalline layer. The main advantage is that it is applicable only for a limited range of glass compositions, and it strongly depends on the chemical composition of the glass and the conditions of the heat treatment. The surface layer of the hardened glass can be both transparent and opaque cloudy. If we compare uh, different methods for uh, of hardening the glass, we can see that after a uh, hard impact on the glass, we can see differences. This is the raw glass laminated glass, chemically hardened glass, and tempered glass. So chemically hardened looks the best, I think. What about surface hardening methods of glass? First of them is mechanical polishing. Yeah, ordinary mechanical polishing. Uh, here you can see the surface of the rough grinded glass. After rough grinding, we can provide medium grinding. That is the medium grinding, the surface after medium grinding. After that, fine grinding is occurred. After the fine grinding, we are making polishing. And you see, the surface is flat here. But still, we have several kinds of the cracks that are going inside of the glass surface. These are cracks that, include, that are included in the Griffiths model. So, what about uh, glass cracks that uh, exist that exist on the glass surface before the polishing and greening processes? While polishing, we increase their uh, diameter. That's why, because of this, the value of the uh, glass surface defects decreases. The chemical polishing is almost the same as the mechanical polishing. Um, here, chemical polishing means the etching of the surface layer by dissolving it in special solutions. And the thickness of the etched layer can vary from 5 to 500 microns. Its main application um, is in the processing of fiber optic preforms and hardening of laser details. So, if we are dealing with the fiber, you, I think you understand that we cannot polish it mechanically because it's very brittle and we can just scratch it. That's why chemical polishing is used in these fields. The main disadvantage is uh, here we should have special measures of labor and environmental selfie because we are working with uh, acids. Um, Sensitivity of the glass surface to any mechanical stress. We should prevent it by using protective coatings. And uh, after chemical polishing, usually the duration of optical properties occurred. 
the th the third type of polishing is the fire polishing. The method consists in rapid heating of the glass surface until it softens under the influence of the local external heat source. Under the action of surface tension forces, surface defects are smoothed and micro cracks are melted. Uh, here we are making recovery of broken chemical bonds in the surface micro defects. We evaporate alkali alkalines and increase the silica content in the near surface layer. The main disadvantage is uh, it is difficult to use for precision optical elements. And the next method is the hardening is the usage of the hardening coatings. We can either use inorganic coatings or organic coatings. And this slide is dedicated to the inorganic coatings. So we form coating by depositing vapors or aerosols of metal compounds. Uh, based on the tin, aluminum or titanium on very hot glass surface. On the contact with the hot glass surface, the pyrolysis or hydrolysis occurs, leading to the formation of oxide films on the corresponding metals of, of the corresponding metals on the glass surface. The thickness of the coating is from a few nanometers to tens of the micron. The main advantage of using the coating is the high speed of coating. And this advantage is that um, the thickness of such co uh, coating is really very small. That's why if we have some um, mechanical impact on the surface, the coating will, you know, disappear. <laughs> and uh, the usage of the polymer coating. Uh, polymer silicon coatings can be applied uh, while we use solutions at room temperature followed by the heat treatment and by treating the surface of glass products with vapors of various polysiloxanes uh, or aerosols of silicon oils. Uh, we also use a hot glass surface uh, and because of this it leads to polymerization of the coating and fixation on the surface of glass. And the last method of surface glass hardening is the thermochemical surface treatment. The treatment of the first surface of heated glass with some gases can increase the strength properties of the glass. That's why we have the sample inside of the furnace and uh, we are treated it with, the <coughs> with different gases. The position on the hot glass surface leads to polymerization of the coatings based on these gases and its fixation to their surface. The main advantages of the thermochemical surface treatment is uh, the achieved increase of the mechanical strength of the glass is also combined by improvement adhesion of glass surface to a polymer film, which used to create the triplex. So this usually we use uh, when um, during the production of triplex. And the disadvantage is uh, uh, using all of these gases has low environmental friendliness, and um, you know it is also very. Uh, this gas, this gas, uh, these gases are also very poisonous for uh, people that are working on the factory making triplets or cars, you know. Okay, so this is the last slide and uh, I want to thank you for your attention and to say you goodbye.